so we're making a web-based massively multiplayer game. We have an excellent chance of being successful because we failed at it before, and the odds of failing twice at the same thing are... Pretty low. Uh, yeah. Astronomical. If you work at a tech company or in a modern corporate office, then there is a good chance that you use Slack. Slack today is a cloud-based instant messaging platform that allows companies to essentially have their own private communication network. And within this network, people can do anything from send content, links, and files, to talking smack about their coworkers' shoes. In a sense, Slack is a much more efficient, faster, and more organized version of company emails. And because of its rapid growth over the last seven years, Slack is now valued at about $12.7 billion on the New York Stock Exchange. But Slack was never supposed to be an instant messaging platform. In fact, Slack's main product was created by accident and was a byproduct of what Slack used to be, a video game company. This is the story of Slack. Stuart Butterfield was a young adult working in the tech sector in the year 2000 when he decided to quit his job and raise $50,000 to start a company called gradfinder.com. The purpose of the company was to help users find other people who graduated from their college or high school. It was actually quite similar to what Facebook would become in its early days. But about six months after GradFinder launched, Stuart Butterfield ended up selling the company and took home somewhere between fifty dollars and $100,000 from the sale. Now, fifty dollars to $100,000 is a good chunk of change. In fact, it was good enough for Stuart to take some time off to think about his next project. But obviously, it's not enough money to live on for an extended period of time. So after after meeting with a group of his friends, they decided they wanted to make their own video game company together. But they wanted to make a game that was not a normal video game. You see, at the time in 2002, virtually every video game out there involved some sort of combat. Whether it was casting spells in Elder Scrolls Morrowind, running over people in cars in Grand Theft Auto, or hitting people with swords in The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, pretty much every single game out there had some sort of combat. So making a game that relied more on creativity rather than combat was going to be a challenge, but it was what the company wanted to try to do. They also wanted to make a game that people could play online with their friends and cooperate with each other. And at the time, this was a relatively new idea. I mean, massive multiplayer online games games like World of Warcraft, were still a couple years away from being launched. Regardless, the team got together, made a prototype, and had people playtest the game. Even though most people were uninterested in this type of game, there was a small group of die-hard people that really enjoyed it. So the team decided that the positive reception from the die-hard fans was enough to pursue this project full-time. So Stuart began trying to raise money for this online game. But this was 2002, a year when no venture capital firms were interested in video game companies, and most venture capital firms were still wary of investing in the tech sector at all because of the dot-com crash. After pitching the game to investors and having zero success, the team decided to fund the game themselves. And they were also able to get about $100,000 from friends and family. After about a year, the game, which they had ironically called Game Never Ending, was not even close to being finished. And after burning through most of their funds, the team needed a new idea to help fund their game. The idea was to build a company that could potentially sell for about a million dollars within the next two years, then use that money to help finish their game. So they brainstormed some ideas. One of their ideas was to take a part of their video game that was responsible for a lot of social interaction and put that into a its own website. And specifically, they took the part of the game that was responsible for uploading photos, creating annotations, having user chat, and more. However, this code was difficult to put into its own website and host on web servers, so Stuart hired programmer Cal Henderson. Cal ended up programming most of this new website on his train commutes to work every day, and he would receive payments in the form of Stuart buying Cal items from his Amazon wish list every once in a while. By 2004, the team had been working on their photo sharing idea and the video game simultaneously, but they had finally reached a point where they knew they had to pick just one of these ideas to focus on. So they voted and chose to focus solely on the photo sharing idea, because they thought they could finish that project in a much shorter time frame than the video game. So they worked on the photo sharing idea, and later that year they finally launched the website which they called Flickr. Now, the initial version of Flickr was not great, but it was pretty innovative because it was the only major company online that allowed users to upload and store photos for free. In fact, when you were to Google how to upload or store photos online, Flickr was always the top search result. 
But Flickr did need to bring in some revenue as well, so some users would pay for a pro account where they could upload more than 200 photos and get some in-depth analytics. And after the first few months of Flickr's launch, the company began to grow. But here's the problem with owning an online storage company in the mid-2000s. You see, this was before cloud computing took off. So today, we can set up an account on Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure, and have servers ready for us to go all around the world. But in 2000, in 2004, Stuart Butterfield and the Flickr team were buying physical servers from Dell, having them delivered to the office once a week, where they would have to spend an entire day just installing servers on the server racks. And they did this pretty much for an entire year, but all of their hard work paid off in 2005 when Yahoo took notice of the photo sharing company. Yahoo offered to buy Flickr for about $20 million, which the Flickr team accepted. A year ago, Flickr was uh, maybe three or 400,000 users, and now it's over 4 million. And everything changes as, as things scale up. Now, all of a sudden, Stuart Butterfield and the Flickr team had become millionaires, conditional upon them staying at Yahoo for at least three Three years. So fast forward three and a half years, Stewart decided to leave Yahoo. And at this time, he had a decent amount of money, was unemployed, and looking for his next venture. And this meant, of course, he wanted to return to the video game space. In 2009, Stewart announced that he would start building another massive multiplayer online game. And this time, it was gonna be different. Because unlike how it was in 2002, online gaming was very popular in 2009. Also, the computing hardware was much cheaper than it used to be, and was much more powerful too. So the team could make a much more awesome game this time around. Now because Stuart had already started a successful company and gaming became much more popular, it was actually super easy for him to raise money this time around. He ended up raising $17.5 million and then began to work on the game. Fast forward two years, their game named Glitch was released to the public. The immediate experience is often walking around, there's a chicken, um, I know that uh, I can squeeze chickens to get a little bit of grain. And the reception for Glitch was actually very similar to their previous game, Game Never Ending. It was that most users didn't really like the game that much and left within a few minutes, but the users that did stay ended up loving it and a high percentage of them became paid users. So once again, Stuart had to make a choice continue to make this game better over time, which is what a lot of modern games do, or do what he did at his previous company, turn some of the technology used to make this video game into another company, and he chose the latter. You see, during the last two years, Glitch was being worked on by a ton of people. And when you work on something as complex as a video game, there are tons of different teams working on very different projects. You might have one team making the music, you might have one team making the animations, one team making the art, one team doing the programming, and so on. And because of this, they ended up developing an internal chat system that helped people communicate through online channels, which was way more efficient than emailing. And when the four co-founders of Glitch realized that that there weren't any instant communication tools like this in the business world, they ended up pivoting their entire company to this new venture that they called Slack. One quick side note was that every investor of the game Glitch had the opportunity to take their money out of the company and cut their losses while they could. But every single one of them kept their money in this venture. This would end up making all of them multi-millionaires. Slack was a pretty small team of about eight people and they stayed this way for a few months. During that time, they ended up getting four companies to try and use their technology. And every single company that used Slack kept using it in perpetuity. Now, none of these companies were paid clients yet, they were just testing out the tech, but this was a good enough sample size for the team to build the full technology and release it on the App Store in early 2014. And boy, did things take off. Within its first two weeks, Slack ended up making $1 million. And if that wasn't amazing enough, Slack ended up raising $120 million in venture capital just six months later, which valued the company at $1.2 billion dollars. And at this time, the company was still growing at about 5 to 10% per week. They were also hiring a new employee every four days. Just six months after that, the company raised another $160 million, which valued the company at $2.76 billion. 
And by 2017, they would raise a total of $841 million, and the company was valued at $5.1 billion. And yes, the company kept growing after that. You see, Slack became one of the fastest growing companies ever. In 2016, their revenue was $105 million. In 2017, it was $220 million. And in 2018, the company made $400 million. So to this day, the company is still growing its revenue by nearly 100% per year. And all of this reached a monumental moment in June of 2019 when Slack went public on the stock market. The company's initial public offering gave Slack a valuation of $19 billion. So think about this, Slack, a multi-billion dollar company that is used by millions of people around the world, from top tech companies to local restaurants to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, all of them use a technology that was made by a video game company that failed twice. So we're making a web-based massively multiplayer game. We have an excellent chance of being successful because we failed at it before, and the odds of failing twice at the same thing are... Pretty low. Uh, yeah, astronomical. So what's the moral of the story here? Well, there are two things that I think you should take from this. One of which is that most of the time, your first business venture will not pan out. So don't give up. And the second thing is that sometimes a really great idea is hidden just under your nose, and it's your job to find it and execute it. Now, if you enjoyed this business documentary on Slack, please check out my other documentaries in the playlist below. And remember to please subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, leave a like, and I will see you guys in the next documentary that you click on in just a few seconds.